Thank you, Carolyn. <clears throat> well, last Sunday we looked at what Proverbs has to say about friends and friendships. And today we are going to see what Proverbs has to say about the fool. Now, we may initially think a sermon on the fool? Surely this will be boring, and it definitely won't help be helpful to daily life. Now, before anybody jumps to that conclusion, I want you to look, please, at the very first verse at the top of your handout. The writer of Proverbs wants to use this verse to motivate you and me to listen carefully to what Proverbs has to say about the fool. Now, look at 17, 12. Better to meet a mother bear robbed of her cubs than to encounter a fool in a display of folly. Now, what is a bear like when her baby cubs have been taken away from her? She is the epitome of anger, fury, and wrath. And if you run into her in that condition, she will rip you apart and tear you from limb to limb. In spite of that, you would still be far better off running into that angry mother bear than turning the corner and encountering a fool. Mother bear will merely kill you. A fool can do that and a whole lot worse. Decades ago, I encountered a fool. To this day, I am still bearing the scars and suffering from the wounds of the encounter with that person. It will be no different from you. And Proverbs wants to keep you and me from suffering in that way. So Proverbs will warn us that we cannot help a fool, but he can hurt us. So stay away from fools. Okay, I'll stay away from them. What's so hard about that? To stay away from them, we must first recognize a fool, and that is not easily done. And why not? Because most fools don't have stupid spread over their face. They don't have the word fool engraved on their forehead. Quite the contrary. Many fools are handsome and beautiful. Not a few are talented in academics, acting, sports, music, religion, politics, etc. Some fools hold positions of leadership, and too many are publicly praised and applauded. Consequently, we don't see the danger in these VIPs, very important people, skilled folks, publicly acclaimed people, famous and well-known individuals, and we need help. To recognize them. And Proverbs offers us wisdom. Wisdom means ability and skill. In here, the uh, ability that Proverbs wants to offer us is the ability, the skill to recognize people who are fools so we stay away from them and avoid the harm they can inflict upon us. Now, I want you to know before we get into this that there are five different Hebrew words that are translated F-O-O-L in the book of Proverbs. And the first one is this word here, petit, 14 times it occurs. And it means open, uncommitted. So a fool is gullible, easily influenced, misled, so that he will become a fool. Second is the word kesil. It's used 50 times. And it basically means dull. A fool is insensitive to truth, yet very opinionated. Thirdly is a veal. This occurs 19 times. Basically, the word means stubborn. So a fool is hardened to the truth, obstinate and self will. Three times, the word naval occurs. And this means boorish. He is morally illiterate, close to the truth, close to God. Well, it's nothing to do with God. And worst of all is the word lace. It means mocker. A fool laughs at skin, sin, scorns wisdom, defies God. Now, add all that up. One hundred and three times Proverbs talks about the fool. Why so many times? Because there are so many fools in the world, 
and they can bring great harm to you and me. Now, since Proverbs will be talking about the fool, let's take a moment and define what is a fool. A fool is a person whose natural imprudent tendencies have matured over the years so as to lack judgment, resist reproof, scorn the sacred, and be an incorrigible, that word means he can't change for the better. He's hopeless. He is headed toward disaster, and thus he is harmful to others. Now, in order to avoid the injury they can inflict upon you and me, we must be able to recognize the character and conduct of fools, and this is what Proverbs will attempt to do for you and me now. Now, last week, I heard uh, Pat make a statement, I chuckled at it, thought about it, and realized she's right about that. Here's what Pat said. We seniors, that's what most of us are, we seniors have to get things right the first time. Think about that. She's correct. Why do seniors have to get things right the first time? Well, now we don't have the strength that we did in the earlier years, Maybe not the resources that we used to have. Maybe not the people, the friends around us that we need to help us if we make a mistake. And it may be harder for us now in our later years to correct things if we didn't get it right the first time. Okay, so let's take this hand down. There are a lot of verses on the food. Remember, 103 of them. I'm not going to give them all to you, but we have quite a bit we want to look at this morning. So I want us to zip through this quite quickly. Now, we've already uh, talked about the uh, first verse, 17, 12. Better to meet a mother bear robbed of her cubs than to encounter a fool in a display of folly. Now, what can that fool, how can that fool hurt you? He can ruin your reputation, he can cause you untoward grief, and he can help you, contribute you to your way to an early grave. Now, the next verse, 27, 3, begins to elaborate on why it's bad to encounter a fool. A stone is heavy and sand is burdensome. Now those two materials are hard to lift up and carry. But a fool's wrath is more grievous than both of them. Now, why more grievous? Well, uh, you can't reason with a fool. His response to you is unpredictable. And he causes you and others limitless trouble. So Proverbs urges us to avoid fools. Look at, uh, look at the third verse, 13, 20. If you associate closely with wise people, you will yourself become wise. Iron sharpens iron. Hang around, rub elbows with wise people. That rubs off on you. You become wise like them. Last half of the verse. But he who keeps company with fools might suffer for it, may suffer for it. No, he will suffer for it. So if you're around fools, the roof is going to fall in on their head. And if you're among them, the roof will fall in on your head as well. Now, it's one thing to avoid a fool. What if you raise one as one of your children? Look at 1725. A foolish child is a grief to his father. This is what awaits dads and bitterness to her who bore her. You too, mom, will be affected by your foolish child. Now, why is that child going to be cause so much trouble to parents? Well, number one, they get in trouble. Number two, they bring social shame upon themselves and maybe to their parents. Thirdly, they cause sorrow. Fourthly, they dash the parents' hopes that the child's going to turn out fine and do well in life. And then it's all, it can also be expensive following behind a foolish child and trying to pay for his damages. Now, how do we avoid rearing a foolish child? Look at 2215. Foolishness is bound up in the heart. That's a very person. Foolishness is naturally inbred in a child. We are all born with foolish tendencies within us. But a good spanking will remove it far from him. Now, 
We're all born with foolish tendencies, and those foolish tendencies are going to go in one or two ways. They're going to increase, 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 and get worse and worse and worse, so the person becomes a fool, or those foolish tendencies will decrease, get less and less and less, and that will be largely due to the parents raising that child correctly and discipline that child when he does what is wrong. Now, but once a person becomes a fool, look at 26, 12. Observe the man who deems himself wise. Now, that person is unteachable. Why? He thinks he's got more knowledge than everybody else. So there's no need for him to listen to anybody. They can't tell him anything. He already knows it. And the last part of that verse says, the second line, there is more hope for a fool than him. Now, how are we going to define hope here? Well, there's, for a person who's not a fool... There's the hope, the possibility, he can be corrected when he does wrong. He can acquire wisdom. There's the expectation that he, he can morally improve in life. There's the possibility that he can reap future blessings. He can avoid trouble. He can end up helping other people. A fool can do none of those things. Now, 20, 27, 22 confirms this idea of no hope. Though you pound a fool in mortar like crushed grain with a pestle. Now what that's referring to is this. The ancient Hebrews would take grain and put it in what's called uh, a mortar, which is like a big bowl, and they would take a pestle, it's like a, a, a stick, a rod, and they would pound, pound, pound the grain, and that would remove the worthless husk around the good edible uh, portion of the grain. And so the idea is, you can remove the bad from the good grain. Now look at that verse. Though you pound a fool in mortar like crushed grain, his stupidity will not leave him. You can't remove foolishness from a fool like you can remove the husk of grain, uh, the husk around the good edible portion of the grain. Um, some years ago over in North West Indiana, a man beat up his wife. She went to the police. They put him in jail. Now, he had to serve three or maybe six months in jail. But as he was in jail, some event occurred in that man's affairs that demanded his immediate attention. The court was gracious. They gave that man a 16-hour furlough. They let him leave jail. 16 hours to go and clear up the issue that occurred that had to be dealt with immediately, and then after 16 hours he was to come back and report to jail. What did this foolish man do? When he got out of jail, instead of going and dealing with the issue that arose in his life, he went home and murdered his wife. Now he's not in jail for three or six months, but for the rest of his life. Now, we need, to, we need to, av to avoid fools. In order to avoid fools, we need to recognize them. And that's what Proverbs wants to do. It wants to t tell us now what are the traits, the characteristics, what is the character and the conduct of a fool like. Let's begin with 1520. A wise child makes his parents glad. Now, they rejoice over his fine character and conduct. But a foolish one despises his parents. Now, uh, why punish a fool in the first place? Well, it satisfies justice, and other people can be warned, and they might learn from that. But a foolish one despises his parents. So the first trait of a, of a fool is he despises dad and mom. Now, um... I don't know if I mentioned this. I wish I would have kept the picture. Before and after. A young, beautiful high school student down in Florida. Before picture, she was voted most beautiful in her high school. Homecoming queen. Head cheerleader. She, she, her father wasn't involved in her life. He didn't live with him. And she resented her mother. She cursed her mother and called her mother profane names. God had enough of that. So one night she went out with her friends. She was involved in a car accident. The car caught on fire. 
She was totally burned. Now, her life was spared, but her nose was burned off, her lips were burned off, her fingers were burned off. Her friends left her. Nobody wanted anything to do with her. And so the, the before picture, beautiful girl. Afterwards, burned, like a burned log. And her friends deserted her. Only one person did desert her, her mother. Still loved her, took care of her. What a change came about in that girl's heart toward her mother. Now she loved, appreciated, respected, was kind and courteous to her mother. Why? She needed her mom. Mom was the only one who would have anything to do with her. So a wise child makes his parents glad, but a foolish one despises his parents. A fool rejects his parents' chastisement. The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. What is that saying? The child that has this kind of attitude toward his parents may well suffer an early grave. God will not tolerate that. Now, 15.4, a healing tongue is a tree of life. That if somebody corrects you with me, if we take that to heart, it can be a blessing to us. But look at the last two lines of 1520. A fool rejects his parents' chastisement, but he who heeds their reproof becomes prudent. So the second trait of a fool is they reject parental discipline. Now look at uh, 2616. Here is the third trait of a, child, of a fool. A fool is wiser in his own judgment than any number of people who speak intelligently. What does that say? He sees himself as wiser than the experts. 18.2, here is the fourth trait of a fool. A fool does not delight in knowledge. He doesn't want to study. He doesn't want to learn. He doesn't receive uh, knowledge imparted to him from other people, but rather in airing his own opinions. So the fourth trait is he doesn't like knowledge, and the fifth trait is he excessively airs his own opinions and that with dogmatism. Now, 17.7, here's the sixth trait of a fool. Proper language is out of character for a fool. Improper speech comes out of his mouth. He's talkative, too talkative. Criticizes his friends, publicly admits immorality, and is proud of his sin, mocks the Bible, lies, curses, and complains. 20, chapter 20 and verse 3, trait number 7. It's honorable. It is honorable for a person to steer clear of strife. Now that person keeps workable communications with different people. He's skilled in avoiding conflict. But every fool explodes in anger. Meaning what? He's like a volcano. He just erupts and spews his wrath everywhere. Chapter 10 and verse 14, trait 8. Wise men conceal their knowledge. Now think about that. A wise person conceals his knowledge. What does that mean? If a person needs to know something, he tells them. If a person doesn't need to know what he knows, there's no reason for him to inform them. Every time we open our mouth and let words go, we run the risk of stirring up a hornet's nest and causing trouble. So a wise man, wise men conceal their knowledge, but the speech of a fool brings imminent ruin unrestrained, harmful speech. 1017, ninth trait. He who heeds instruction displays conduct leading to real life. Instruction. That instruction, if we receive it, can correct what's amiss in our character. It can mend our flawed conduct. But a fool disregards reproof and goes astray. He rejects rebukes and he regresses. He doesn't get better, he gets worse. The tenth trait, 1514, an intelligent man strives to learn more and more. That person values knowledge, and he is dissatisfied with how much he knows. Last line, but fools hunger for and are occupied with trash. Playboy magazine, pornography, trashy novels, X-rated movies, worldly conversations. So the 10th trait is they are hungry for and feed on junk and harmful things. 1724, the 11th trait. 
A perceptive person relentlessly, relentlessly pursues wisdom. But wandering the ends of the earth or the eyes of a fool, he lacks worthy goals. He pursues non-essential goals. He lacks worthy objectives. 1 7, chapter 1 and verse 7, 12th trait. Reverence for and submission to the Lord is, fir- is the first step in acquiring knowledge. That's first base. But fools despise wisdom and moral instruction. They loathe moral instruction and guidance. The 13th trait of a fool is mentioned in chapter 17 and verse 16. Why indeed does a fool waste tuition to acquire wisdom when he has no intention of using it? He does not make use of knowledge. He learns to forget what he has learned. 14th trait, chapter 10 and verse 23. As the, as the committing of evil is fun to the fool, that's his entertainment. So a man of understanding delights in living in accord with wisdom. So the 14th trait is a fool delights in sinning. Now, um, I had a student at Moody named Kevin. Real sweet fine fellow, graduates, he becomes a student down at Dallas Theological Seminary. He gets into a relationship with a fine young lady who is a classmate at Dallas Seminary. He calls me one night and he says this, Dr. Sauer, I am so ashamed of myself. I did something with this fine girl I thought I would never do. I'm so, I'm so upset I don't know what to, what to say about it. Well, Kevin, what did you do? Well, I asked her to walk around the block with me. We were having a delightful walk and delightful talk. And then I took my hand and reached down and held her hand. What else did you do? That's it. I just held her hand. That's okay, Kevin. Dr. Sauer, is that really okay that I held her hand? Yes. (laughs) He He was sensitive to righteousness. He had never touched a girl. He had never held a girl's hand before. And he did it, and he was wondering, did I do something wrong? So a fool is not sensitive to righteousness at all. Um, In fact, what this is telling us is that a fool delights in sinning. Now, I don't know if I've mentioned this fella or not, but uh, some years ago I had another student at Moody. And I want you to know, this fella, this student was handsome, very good speaker, just out, had a lot of charisma. He got into a relationship with a, 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 a student from a Western European country. And that girl said to the fella, I want to take our friendship, our boyfriend and girlfriend relationship, and put it under Dr. and Mrs. Sauer for their guidance. And the fella said, no, we don't need that. I don't want anybody peering into our relationship. And she said, if you want, if you want me to be your girlfriend, you don't have any choice about it. Here's the hoop that you've got to jump through. If I, I will require that you and I be under their guidance. So he didn't have any choice. To have this girl as his girlfriend, he had to go along with her request and put their friendship under me and Sue. As that year came to an end, I just sensed something wasn't right. So I called that girl into my office by herself. And I said, how are things going between you and your boyfriend? Not good. Spell that out for me, I asked. Well, the other night, he took me to a hotel in Chicago, and we spent the night together. Sleep in the same bed, yes. Have sex, no. I don't believe that, I said. Well, I'm telling you, we didn't. Well, okay, even if you're telling me the truth, and you didn't have intercourse, I just bet there was improper touching. Am I right about that? Yes. And not only that, when I went to get a shower, he asked me if he could watch me undressed. I told him no. So I took her, led her to an empty classroom, said, stay here. I called him into my office. Now, he didn't know that I just talked to his girlfriend. So when he comes into my office, I ask him, how are things between you and your girlfriend? Oh, just fine. Are your, is your relationship morally pure? Yes, sir, it is. Did you take her to a hotel recently and spend the night with her? No, sir. Did you sleep in the same bed with him? Did not. Did you ask her to undress in front of you? No, sir, I wouldn't do that. Just a minute. I went to the empty classroom, led her back in, and when he, she walks into my office, he, he realized, uh-oh, Dr. Cyrus already talked to her. And I said, one of you is lying to me, and I want to know who it is. Long silence. And she said, I'm telling the truth. I would never fabricate these charges if they weren't true. 
And he said, okay, okay, it all happened. I just forgot about it. Oh, no, you didn't forget about it. If I spent a night sleeping with a woman that wasn't my wife, I would remember that the rest of my life, and it's no different with you. And uh, then he said this. Dr. Sauer, I wish you loved me. I wish you could accept me as I am. And I said, I love you enough to tell you what you don't want to hear. I love you enough to tell you when you're wrong. you got a problem. As I investigated him, he was a married man who committed adultery. His wife divorced him. Just before entering student Moody as a student, he got some non-Christian woman in Chicago pregnant. And now he is a pastor of a church. Would you like him to be your pastor? He prays on women. And when I tried to correct him, he blamed me. I didn't love him. And I said, if we could go back to when you were 17. Now, as I investigated his life, he had one disastrous affair with one female after another. If we could turn the clock back to when you were 17 and link you up with a godly man who could teach you how to walk with God and treat women like ladies, maybe you would not have been, you wouldn't have this, all these train wrecks behind you. So... Fools delight in sinning. If you call, you call them on the carpet for it, now they turn against you and you're the guilty person. Look at, look at uh, 14, 16. Here's the 16th, uh, the 15th. Look at 14, 9. Here's the 15th trait of fools. Fools mock their own sin and that of their friends. But there is goodwill among the upright. So the 15th quality is... Sin is a laughable matter to fools. Look at uh, 14, 16. Here's the 16th trait. A wise person is cautious and so avoids misfortune, but a fool, being arrogant and overconfident, needlessly plunges into many dangers. Dangers, that's his destiny. Fools are overconfident and careless, and they end up suffering for it. 17, 10. Trait 17. A light rebuke makes a deeper impression on a perceptive person than a hundred blows on the back of a fool. The trait, he fails to profit from any punishment. You lightly rebuke a wise person, he takes that to heart. That light rebuke does him more good than removing the shirt from a fool and laying a hundred blows on his back. Doesn't do a bit of good. He's just angry that you punished him. Now, look at uh, 2611, trait 18. As a dog returns to his vomit. Now think about that. That's euphemism. You're trying, to put, you're trying to play something harsh down and make it more acceptable. When it says he returns to his vomit, it means a dog ate something. It made him sick. He vomited it out. Now later he goes back and eats his vomit. Well, if it made him sick the first time, it'll make him sick the second time. So as a dog eats his vomit, he eats what made him sick. So a fool repeats his foolishness. He repeats his mistakes. We are very familiar with the expression, a repeat offender. Why are there so many repeat offenders? They break the law, you put them in prison, they serve their sentence, they're released, and they go and they commit crime again, and back to prison they go. They don't learn from punishment. 1424, the distinguishing mark of wise people is their wealth, not money, the real riches of life, wisdom, good moral advice, moral strength. But the chief characteristic of fools is their stupidity. Fools don't realize they are telling people without, without knowing it how foolish and stupid they are. And what's meant by stupidity? A more damaging exposure, re revelation of his deficiency. When fools talk, when they act, they're not aware they're telling you how foolish, how stupid they are. They think they're impressing the rest of us. Look at 12, 16. The, mo the moment he is insulted, the fool is made known by his angry retaliation. 20th trait, quickly retaliates from insult. But look at the opposite of it. But a prudent person conceals the hurt that insult 
inflicts on him. 1417, a quick-tempered man acts rashly, but a man of discretion patiently bears much abuse. So anger leads to impulsive, rash, reckless action. Um, I used to be the interim pastor of a church uh, not too far from here. And uh, there was in the church a man and a woman. I spent a lot of time with them outside the pulpit trying to help them with their marriage. One day, the wife has a doctor's appointment. And he says, I want to drive you to the doctor's appointment. She said, no, I want to drive myself. So they got into an argument about who is going to drive the lady, the wife, to the doctor's office. The man got so angry, on the table was a butcher knife. He picks it up and stabs his wife right here and severs her artery, and she starts bleeding to death. Well, he called, he called the paramedics. They came out, and they barely saved her life. Now, how long did it take him to grab that knife, pick it up, and stab her? Just seconds. For because of that rash reaction in a fit of anger, he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Now look at that verse again. 14, 14, 17. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, rashly, but a man of discretion patiently bears much abuse. Chapter 10 and verse 18, a fool conceals his hatred with flattery and then defames one hated as soon as his back is turned. So the 22nd trait is a fool will flatter you publicly and then in, uh, when your back is turned, slander you. And why is that foolish? Well, he is injuring the victim's reputation. He's so in discord. And people, when they recognize that, they will despise him. Chapter 24, verse 7. Wisdom is unattainable for a fool. He will never become wise. In the gate, now that means in positions of leadership, he must not be allowed to shape public policy. So the 23rd uh, trait is he's denied, he is denied or removed from important positions. shouldn't be there in the first place. Chapter 21 and verse 20. The necessities of life, along with some luxuries, are in a prudent man's home. But a fool squanders away his money. He squanders his own or other people's uh, resources. Now, uh, let's take the president of uh, Ukraine. Now, recently, he and his wife were in America. Just recently, they were in America. Do you know what his wife did? She spent $1.1 one million dollars on jewelry. What do you think she got that money from? Probably from our military aid. You give money to leaders of certain countries, they're the ones who are going to divvy it up. And if they're corrupt, a good portion of, that, of our aid to them is going in their pocket. It was surely indiscreet for her to come over here and spend a million dollars on jewelry which she doesn't need when so many of her people back in Ukraine are suffering. So a fool will waste his own assets. He'll waste the assets of other people as well. 132. The simple person's refusal of wisdom will ruin him, and the complacency of a fool will destroy him. So he's complacent. He's satisfied with where he is morally. Um, not long ago, my wife, there's a couple, my wife and I have been trying to help in their marriage. And after a while, the husband told me this. I want you to know that my wife and I have decided that our marriage is not going to improve. We're not going to put forth any effort for it to improve. We're going to continue to live with each other and hate and despise each other for the benefit of our children. That's contradictory. Those children are going to be, they're little sponges. They're going to be soaking up the toxic atmosphere in the home created by dad and mom. So a fool, okay, we're not doing well in marriage. 
but I'm, we're not going to put forth the effort to improve things. That's a mark of a fool. Now, I want you to look at 26.4 and 26.5. These two verses almost kept the book of Proverbs from being uh, put into the canon of the Old Testament. Why? It looks like they contradict each other. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. And then 26.5 says, answer a fool according to his folly. Are they contradicting each other? Well, I want, let's just consider for a moment our preposition, I in. We read it, we use it all the time, hundreds of times a week. Our prepositions have different nuances. They have different meanings. Our preposition in can denote time. He was born in 1950. It can denote place. Uh, the the uh, dog is in the house. It can denote condition. She is in love. So our prepositions have different meanings. Hebrew prepositions have different meanings. And that's what we have here. The preposition key is used two times uh, in these verses, and they have different meanings. It can, uh, key can ha it has a modal nuance, which means the manner in which you do something. It has a, a, a nuance of norm, the standard by which something is done. Now, would you look at 26.4? Don't answer a fool. Now, here, the word, the preposition according to denotes modal. So let me translate it. Don't answer a fool. Don't respond in kind to a fool. If he insults you, don't you insult him back. If he spews profanity in your face, don't spew profanity back in his face. If he spits on you, don't spit on him. Don't respond in kind to a fool, lest by stooping to his level, you yourself become like him. Now in 26.5, same preposition key has a different meaning. Answer a fool as his stupidity deserves. Sometimes when you respond to a fool, the proper response is utter silence. Don't say anything to him. On, with another fool, maybe the proper uh, response is to give him a sharp rebuke. Maybe with still a different fool, the, the proper response is remove his shirt, take a rod, and lay blows on his back. So answer a fool as his stupidity deserves, lest he thinks himself wise. Now, more advice is given in 23.9. Don't waste your breath trying to teach a fool. Don't instruct him, for he will despise your wisdom. It seems nonsense to him. Why not instruct him? When I give him the truth, he won't receive it. He despises what's coming out of your mouth. Next, 26.6. He who entrusts a message to a fool cuts off his own feet, fails to communicate, and suffers self-inflicted injury. The point of this, don't entrust responsibilities to fools. They're irresponsible. 26.7, as the legs of a man hang useless. Now, this man has legs, but he can't use them. So is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. The fool can't make good use of wisdom. Don't give him wisdom. He'll abuse and misuse it. 26.8, something else must not be given to a fool. As the binding of a rock in a slingshot is dangerous, well, you can shoot and hurt people. Or you can, it can backfire and, and the rock hits you. As the binding of a rock in a slingshot is dangerous, so is the bestowing of honor on a fool. You honor a fool and it can backfire. It can do damage to him, damage to other people. 26.9, as a drunkard dangerously swings a thorn bush in his hand. Now let's think of a drunk man swinging a baseball bat in a crowd. Just as perilous is a fool, quoting a proverb, he misuses wisdom and somebody can be hurt by it. Don't hire a fool, according to 26.10. As a sniper randomly injures others, who does he injure? Who does he shoot? Anybody that walks by. So does an employer who hires a fool or anyone who happens to come along. An employer should hire a competent person, not a fool, who will make a mess. 29.9. If a wise man is at odds with a fool, whether he rages, whether the fool rages or laughs, there will be no reconciliation. What's that saying? You offend a fool... You have a permanent, lifelong enemy. He will not forgive you if you offend him. 14.7, leave a fool's presence. Have nothing to do with him, for you will find no knowledge in his speech. Okay, what points of application can we take away from this 
these warnings in, in uh, Proverbs about the fool. Number one, you cannot help a fool, but he can hurt you. You can't do them any good, but they can do you plenty of harm. So stay away from fools. Secondly, we all were born with foolish tendencies. They either increase or decrease. Let's spurn our foolishness and pursue virtues. Thirdly, find wise people and spend time with them as they will sharpen us in prudence and morality. Fourthly, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Fifthly, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom. They'll never reach first base in a relationship with God. Now, uh, I want to I want to end by saying this. I th- uh, we're we're uh, we were talking this morning about the uh, COVID vaccine. Some people take the COVID vaccine; they still come down with COVID. I think the best vaccination against becoming a fool is receiving the Son of God as our Savior. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Because of Him, that is God the Father, because of Him, you are in a relationship with Jesus, who became for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. What does that mean? God the Father was pleased to bring about our conversion and lead us to Christ. And when we become a Christian, Jesus redeems us. He bestows His righteousness. We're clothed in His righteousness. He begins to sanctify us, purify us, and He begins to make us wise. To me, the best protection against becoming a fool is to become a Christian. And I trust that you are. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we want you to consider that Jesus died for you. And you need to be redeemed. You need to be made righteous. You need to be, have wisdom given to you. You need to be sanctified. And the Holy Spirit can rub out and erase these foolish tendencies that all of us have and make us men and women of God. Now, um, it was week before last that Susan's brother died. And today is his memorial service down in Texas, which Sue and I are going to join by Zoom, um, that was a brother. It's difficult to lose a brother. But as mentioned, Brian this week lost his mother. Now, Sue and I have lost our mothers, and we've learned it is hard to lose a mom. And that's where Brian is. She died Monday. So, folks, we want to be praying for him And Hannah, Hannah just broke down. That was her mother-in-law. And yet she was grieved over that. But I want you to know they were faithful in talking to his mom about her relationship with Christ before she died. So, Heavenly Father, I ask that you be sensitive to Sue's family, especially today in the service. We ask, Lord, that you would draw near to Brian and Hannah and pour out your compassion and sympathy on them over losing the loss of his mom. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to have ears that hear what you say in Proverbs, that we might be given the wisdom that will give us the ability and skill to live life correctly. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.